She's had a, as the chair knows, she's uh, the presiding officer knows, she's had a skiing accident, but we're glad to see she's up and ambulatory and uh, here at work. And we're delighted she's back. With that, I yield the floor. There we go. I thank the senator from North Dakota. I think we will soon see that the senator from Alaska is not only ambulatory, but her vocabulary is working quite well <laughs> also. Mr. Chair President. recognizes the senator from Alaska. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, request permission to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today I am, I'm rising to talk about an issue that has captivated uh, my residents, my constituents up in the state of Alaska. We've got a mountain that is erupting. Mount Readout, which is located about 150 miles uh, southwest of, of Anchorage, our largest uh, community, has been more than active in the past week or so and uh, generating a great deal of, of press, a great deal of interest, and uh, a considerable amount of, of impact in my state. So I wanted to, wanted to take just a few minutes this afternoon to talk about what is happening up north, talk a little bit about the importance of volcano monitoring. I think uh, we're all aware that there have been some recent comments made about uh, federal spending for volcano monitoring and the suggestion that perhaps this might be wasteful money, that we don't have any need to be monitoring volcanoes. And I can assure you, Mr. President, that monitoring volcanoes is, is critically important to the nation, to the world, and particularly to, to Alaska right now, where, as I say, we are, we are being held hostage by a volcano. Um, a little bit of a personal note here this afternoon. My boys' spring break concluded last evening. They've been up in the, in the state enjoying spring skiing, and they're grounded by Mount Readout. Uh, they may be home Wednesday evening. Now, others might think that this is a, is a bad thing, but for those uh, young pages here this morning, when you're 17 and you're shut out of school for an additional three days after, after uh, spring break concludes, and you have to stay in Alaska and keep skiing, maybe the volcano is not a bad thing. But uh, uh, there's a very serious aspect to, to what we are talking about. Mount Readout has erupted 17 times now since March 22nd. And when it was initially uh, under watch, you would see the, the kind of the steam and the haze coming off the volcano. Uh, but then we started to see some, some pretty significant eruptions, eruptions that would go 65,000 feet up into the air. This is, this is a picture of Mount Redoubt. Uh, this is actually taken back in 1989, the last time that Mount Redoubt was, was active. But what happens is these, these plumes go straight up into the air, get caught by the jet stream at 40,000 or 60, 65,000 feet, and then that ash is dispersed throughout, throughout the state. Uh, what we've been seeing up north this week, and, and actually for about the past 10 days, is, is cancellation of, of, of air flights, uh, complete closure of the Anchorage International Airport over the weekend. Alaska Airlines alone has canceled about 230 flights. It's affected about 10,000 passengers, including uh, my boys. Um, what, what is happening as a result of this, imp uh, this, this volcano really does become quite personal. We've got school districts down in the southern part of the state where they've experienced the ash fallout, where the students have, have dust mask, respirator mask, uh, so that they're not breathing the, the ash that's coming through. Home Depot made a point of staying open 24 hours a day so that people could get the, the masks, the ventilator masks, get tape to put around their windows and around the doors because this ash, this particulate is so fine that it comes 
underneath and into your home. It gunks up your computers. It, it, clogs, uh, it, it clogs your car engines. It's most, um, most worrisome, most threatening, though, with, with airplane engines. The, the ash itself is, is this particulate that is like ground up stone and has the, the, the very debilitating effect of, of really uh, messing up your engine. So what is happening is at the airport, the engines of the airplanes, if they're not inside, which we don't have the capacity for them, are being wrapped in like saran wrap. It's more sophisticated than saran wrap, but having to wrap them. Our military at, at Elmendorf and uh, Fort Richardson are looking to relocate their assets so that the, these very fine precision aircraft are not in harm's way. A lot happening as a result of, of this volcano and this series of eruptions. The volcanoes in Alaska make up well over three quarters of U.S. volcanoes that have erupted in the, in the last 200 years. About 50 volcanic eruptions occur around the world every year. And this is according to USGS. It seems like a high number, but most of them are not, are not eruptions that make much in the terms of, of headlines. The United States ranks third behind Indonesia and Japan in its number of historically active volcanoes. And that's why it's so very, very important to fund the volcano monitoring, which in Alaska is through the Alaska Volcano Observatory. The AVO, as we call it, is one of five volcano observatories in the U.S. It's a joint program of the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, the Geophysical Institute of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the State of Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys. The AVO is, is unique in the U.S. and probably in the world in that it is a thoroughly collaborative undertaking of federal scientists, state scientists, university faculty, and students. AVO was formed in 1988 after an eruption of Mount Augustine. It uses federal, state, and university resources to monitor and study Alaska's hazardous volcanoes to predict, to give that early warning and record eruptive activity, and to also mitigate volcanic hazards in life and property. Alaska has over 30 active volcanoes that are currently being monitored by the AVO. There's no other observatory in the world that even comes close to that number. The AVO also analyzes available satellite data twice daily for thermal anomalies and ash plumes at about 80 volcanoes in the North Pacific. Russian volcanoes frequently put ash into areas where the U.S. has aviation safety responsibilities. Alaska's active volcanoes also offer superb opportunities for basic scientific investigation of volcanic processes. An important component of AVO's program is to conduct research at selected volcanic centers. Now, I mentioned, uh, Mr. President, the, the hazards to, to air traffic. Um, and I, I think it's important for people to understand that when we're talking about volcanic ash being in the air and, and being distributed, it's not just something that is, is, is dirty and an annoyance, but it has the potential to be life-threatening and absolutely deadly. If the, if the jet engines ingest the volcanic ash, uh, the potential for, for catastrophe is very real. Back in 1989, it was December 15th of 89, there was a Boeing 747. It was flying about 150 miles northeast of Anchorage, and it, it went through the ash plume um, that erupted from, from the Redoubt volcano. It was flying at night, so it couldn't see that they were flying into an ash cloud. We didn't have the monitoring process, so the pilots are, are just flying on through, and uh, it uh, sucked in the ash at, uh, uh, I'm not entirely certain what altitude they were flying when they first um, uh, encountered the ash, but the plane, with 231 passengers aboard, lost more than 10,000 feet elevation. All four engines lost power. And they went down 10,000 feet. That's about two miles. Now, we do a lot of flying around here. Next time you're up in that airplane, look down and think about losing all the power in your 747 
and falling out of the sky almost two miles before these incredibly skilled pilots were able to restart the engines. They were able to, to, uh, to land the airplane safely. No lives lost. But uh, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been a passenger on that, on that jet aircraft. The airplane suffered about $80 million in damage. All four of those engines were, were, were shot. And, uh, and, and again, the good news out of the story is that there, there was, uh, was no uh, loss of life. The FAA estimates based on information provided by the FAA that more than 80,000 large aircraft per year and 30,000 people per day are in the skies over and potentially downwind of many of Alaska's volcanoes, mostly on the heavily traveled Great Circle routes between Europe, North America, and Asia. It's along this route that kind of coincidentally follows the northern portion of the Pacific Ring of Fire there's over 100 volcanoes capable of depositing ash into the flight plan. Some are in Japan, many in Russia, but about half of them are in Alaska. And by analyzing the satellite imagery and working with the National Weather Service to predict where the winds will carry the ash, AVO assists the FAA in warning aircraft of those areas to avoid. Volcanic eruptions from Cook Inlet volcanoes, these are uh, right there around the, the south central um, area, Mount Spur, Mount Redoubt, Iliamna, and Augustine, can have severe impacts as, as these volcanoes are nearest to Anchorage, which of course is our largest population center. Back in 1989, when Redoubt blew before, uh, I was working in an office and essentially we were shut down because the ventilation systems need to be turned off, the computers needed to be turned off and covered. Um, it, it, the impacts uh, economically and, and um, in, in all ways are, are, are very, very real. The last major series of eruptions of Mount Redoubt were in 1989 and 1990. These eruptions, which totaled 23, so right now with Redoubt we're already up to 17. Uh, the 23 that took place in 1989 took place over a six-month period. We're seeing 17 eruptions over a period of about 10 days. These eruptions uh, seriously affected the populace, the commerce, the oil production throughout Cook Inlet, and, and air traffic about as far away as the state of Texas. Total estimated economic costs were about $160 million, making this eruption of Redoubt the second most costly in U.S. history after Mount St. Helens. It had significant impact on the aviation and oil industries, as well as on the people of the Kenai Peninsula. As I mentioned, this, this volcanic, volcanic ash is, is fine bits of, of abrasive glass that can damage lungs, it can damage vehicles, electronic equipments. Um, right now, as we speak, in, in the area just outside of, of Anchorage at Mount Alyeska, where I was a couple weeks ago, um, we are hosting the U.S. National Ski Championships. And uh, we've got some of the country's finest athletes who are performing on that hill. They can't race if they are breathing in these, this volcanic particulate. The Redoubt eruption almost also damaged five commercial jetliners. This again is back in 1989 caused several days worth of airport closures and airline cancellations in Anchorage and on the Kenai Peninsula, drifting ash clouds again as far away as Texas. International volcano monitoring is also a role of the federal government. It helped very likely save many lives and significant money in the case of the 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatabu in the Philippines, where the U.S. had military bases at the time. The eruption back in 91, lasted more than 10 hours, sent a cloud of ash as high as 22 miles into the air that grew to more than 300 miles across. The USGS spent less than $1.5 million monitoring the volcano and was able to warn of the impending eruption, which allowed the authorities to evacuate residents as well as aircraft and other equipment from U.S. bases. The USGS estimates that the efforts saved thousands of lives and prevented property losses of at least $250 million. It's not enough, though, just to justify a program by identifying a danger. The more important question is whether something can be done to reduce the impact of a volcanic eruption 
in terms of property damage and loss of life. And that means getting people out of harm's way by providing advance warning. And that's exactly what the USGS Volcano Hazards Program seeks to do through the existing volcano observatories in the United States. Some may say that there's an abundance of caution going on right now in Anchorage by shutting down the airport, by canceling flights, by diverting it. But as a mother whose sons are there and are, are, are going to be relying on air travel, by golly, I want to make sure that we err on the side of caution. I want to make sure that we're using those scientists who will tell us exactly when it's safe to be back up flying. The advances made in monitoring can now provide much more accurate and timely predictions of eruptions. Back in, in 1989, AVO was only able to predict, provide a few days' warning before Mount Redoubt erupted. This year, they began to detect activity, and they notified the public a couple months before it eventually erupted. But the biggest challenge remains finding an adequate and stable source of funding. The USGS Vol Volcano Hazards Program has been constantly underfunded. Both USGS and the FAA provide funding, but it's not enough to manage all of the observatories or provide for an expansion of the system to cover increased monitoring and volcano research. It's because of the inadequate funding and critical importance of this program that I intend to introduce a bill that will provide the funding stability that volcano monitoring needs. This program shows that with a modest investment, a very large benefit can be produced in reducing the impacts of catastrophic events. My legislation will establish a national volcano early warnings and monitoring system within the United States Geological Survey to monitor, warn, and protect citizens from undue and avoidable harm from volcanic activity. The USGS will coordinate a management plan with the other relevant federal departments, including the Department of Transportation, FAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Department of Homeland Security, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The legislation authorizes appropriations annually to the Department of Interior to carry out the act. Mr. President, I appreciate the, uh, the attention um, that you have given me on this issue here this afternoon. As I mentioned, uh, all eyes are upon the state of Alaska right now as we watch this volcano. But this is not the only one that we are actively monitoring and watching. We want to make sure that not only the, the residents of, of the state of Alaska are provided uh, a level of, of, of safety through monitoring and warning, but any of, of those who may be in danger because of Mother Nature doing what Mother Nature does on a very pr unpredictable uh, trajectory. So what we are what we're attempting this afternoon by uh, introduction of, of legislation to establish the National Volcano Early Warning and Monitoring System, I, I believe is, is good and look forward to, to having the support of my colleagues on this very important matter. With that, Mr. President, uh, I thank the Chair and yield the floor, and I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. 